Hello, leaders of the world. Welcome to Spread Love and Organizations, a podcast for purpose-driven healthcare leaders striving to make life better around the world by leading their teams with genuine care, servant leadership, and love. I'm Naji, your host, joined today by Jubin Hatamzadeh, Chief Operating Officer at Greentown Labs, a community on a mission to solve the climate crisis through entrepreneurship and collaboration. Prior to joining Greentown Labs, Jubin served as the head of operations and administrative services at French Tech Hub, where he led a team that helped international technology companies expand and succeed in the U.S. market. He has also worked at MDL Corporation and NeuroRx Research. Jubin, it is a great pleasure and honor to have you with me today. I would love first to hear more about your personal story and what's in between the lines of your inspiring journey. Uh, my personal story is I don't want to go too back that I wanted to be, you know, cowboy or Superman when I was a kid, but uh, <laughs> I, I always, you know, had the desire to to go to medicine and engineering was something really, uh, something that aspired at some point. So I ended up studying biomedical engineering. Um, I was born and raised in Iran, so uh, I pursued. Uh, I, you know, got the opportunity to get a bachelor's degree in uh, biomedical engineering back in Iran and worked in a medical devices company right after the school, but always wanted to explore the world and uh, learn new things and kind of push my boundaries. So I pursued my graduate degree in, in Canada in the same discipline and uh, joined uh, a lab which is affiliated to the school that I got my master's degree. And then there was a spin-off. Uh, that that spin-off was a startup company that I really enjoyed being part of the team, first few employees to get a lot of things done from setting up the office to be the project manager, to be the person who was also one of the people who was analyzing the images for multiple sclerosis, uh, servicing to uh, uh, biotech and pharma companies uh, to, to serve the humanity on uh, basically on um, uh, clinical trials. And then I pursued my, I pursued my heart, which was my, my girlfriend at the time, who's my wife now, uh, was a business school in Philadelphia. I wanted to be with her and uh, found an opportunity that was also enticing to me. And that was joining a manufacturing company. So you may not find correlation between what I studied at a manufacturing company in the lighting environment and then in the lighting industry, but it's all about the transfer of skill and using basically something like the concept of certain, certain disciplines in engineering that you can apply. So I joined this, this company, um, being the head of quality control, and uh, that, that, that was really, really uh, energizing to me and motivating because I could solve problems, uh, things that I could not even imagine that, that, that I could. You know, from smaller things to from small things to kind of a bigger things, but it is saving you know companies uh, cost improvement, uh, improving the things, and so on. And then um, so all of these have been kind of entrepreneurial environment that I work uh, at. And at some point, we decided to move to Boston. Uh, after my wife finished uh, the uh, MBA program, I uh, joined the consulting company. And I also found a boutique consulting uh, business, uh, uh, which was a subsidiary of a French uh, government supported entity. And that was basically my journey with a company initially called European France and then Optic 21 and finally changed to uh, French Tech Hub. And uh, joined as a business developer for life sciences and uh, grew into operations, led basically the 
uh, designed and led the operations uh, and administrative services that were serving over 100 uh, French clients in the focus in uh, the technology. And then, uh, you know, spending 11 years in that company, the company uh, was sold, that that business division was sold to uh, an accounting firm. And that was basically a moment for me to realize that what I want to do next with my life, because I was not an accountant. And I, I was looking for kind of a different type of work. And, uh, and uh, I joined Green on that. Basically, the opportunity that, that I found at that time as a VP of operations hit the, hit the check mark. So what inspires me, um, one of them is, has been the opportunity to learn and do things that I did not have any background necessarily in area that has been created, seemed created for me. And I had the ability to problem solve, be with smart people, and also be working with people who are good people. And, you know, by the time that I joined Greentown Lab, what was at the end of the day important to me at that point, I had to two little children who are now uh, older. But uh, what is the story that I want to tell my children? That's what I do. And what kind of impact do the work I do has? Uh, and, you know, now working in the environment, the, the, the impact is very obvious to, to, to everybody, and it's not deniable that this is something to saving the future for, for our children and the generations after that, and being a better people, uh, not destroying the, the earth further. Well, thank you so much, uh, Jubin, for this inspiring uh, journey and several things. So I have different questions for you uh, sure. going from here. So um, you were born, raised in Iran, you left, you lived in several countries. Uh, and I felt throughout you're focused on impact. So it's interesting you started in healthcare. The majority of um, our listeners here are healthcare uh, leaders. Uh, so focused on this purpose of making life better. And obviously now what you're doing is exactly this from a, in a large scale of making making the world better uh, from uh, from the climate crisis we're living. I, I would love to hear. Your, your personal journey, what you took from those different experiences in different parts of the world, from where you were born to where you are today, what, what is kind of the key life lesson you take with you to lead today your teams uh, in your company today and in other experiences you had? Uh, thank you. I would say two things. Number one, um, going back to you know, to the, to the fact that my father is an architect and I was just uh, following him through, you know, going, going through to his office uh, after school for a change or sometimes to the construction site, just observing, seeing, enjoying to see that how things are being made, following his conversation that I had no clue what it was about, but with the, with the builders, with the masons, with the welders, etc. So, I I knew that you know there is a lot of interest in, in learning things and doing things, right, and at some point in my life it was during the summertime I was eleven we had a neighbor in the in a countryside when we had a place and uh, our neighbor happened to be an architect and he was making sitar instrument that was basically my introduction to uh, an Iranian uh, musical instru instrument and it was a summertime I stayed with them. And I became his apprentice, just watching him doing wood, uh, uh, making instruments. And I was helping, you know, here and there. And, and, and later on, I realized that, you know, I, I learned some carpentry. I learned this and that. And uh, somebody at some point told me that, listen, it doesn't matter what you have learned. At some point, those skills become useful. 
And I always believe in that. So, you know, transferable skills, I think it's a, one of the most important things uh, in life that we have to invest. And the curiosity is very important. And uh, focus is important, but curiosity is important that, okay, what you are exposed to, what we can learn, because we never know where life takes us. And we try to predict life, but sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't work. And all of those become handy at some point. So that's, I really believe in now. The other point is how to deal with uncertainty, which can be nerve-wracking. And it happens in work and it happens in life. And the lesson was, uh, I was born a few years before the Iranian revolution, so you can calculate my age very easily. And uh, as I was in the period that I know what was going around me, uh, there was a war between Iran and Iraq. And at some point, uh, I remember that both countries were bombarding each other. So there was an airstrike both ways. And you we were just going to shelter and there was no shelter. The shelter was the basement of the building we were. So we could live after an explosion or we never know that it, it, it was going to impact us or not. So that was a big point of uncertainty, right? And there was no escape. I had to live there, we had to live there. My parents, my father had to go to work and I had to go to school. So that was one big point of uncertainty. And then those kind of airstrikes stopped and then they relaunched by sending missiles, which you couldn't even expect. There was no siren sometimes, so you would hear an explosion. And then it was a change, moving from a company country to another country. So I did it, you know, twice in my life, once from Iran to Canada and the, the other one from Canada to the U.S. So everywhere you go, there is an adaptation. There is a cultural adaptation. There is something that you take in. You have to really uh, contemplate. You have to adapt, digest. So the, the key lesson in life is uh, being flexible. and learning to, to deal with uncertainty. And I think that at certain points, I've been successful to do that, and sometimes I've not been successful to do that. And I could see that, you know, during the pandemic, it became very handy for me that I was overseeing team that the work was tied to the physical space. And physical space became a concern because people were working from home, but at Greentown Labs, which is a climate tech incubator, and we have lab space, desk space, uh, desk got very low occupancy during the pandemic. Everybody was working from home, but lab was a space that people needed, and they could not do those kind of work at home. So we needed to keep the space safe. And I had to basically find kind of a meaningful work to retain my team and keep them also motivated and inspired during a very uncertain and dark. Well, thank you so much, uh, Jubin. I unfortunately relate to part of your story with living war as a child, as you know. Um, and really, I love how you frame the key lessons from learning from uncertainty and, you know, keep on pushing and moving forward and making an impact as you've done. Um, when you talked about uh, the what, what you've done with your teams to keep them uh, safe, motivated, and literally building tech that changed the world, I I'm intrigued. How did you do that? Was there like a special recipe? Now looking back, you say, okay, this is what I've done that helped them do it well and that you will replicate next time. and it, and. Yeah. Comparatively, is there something you would do differently? Certainly. So, yeah, the number one thing I think that, you know, pandemic has taught us a lot of things. And one of the key takeaways from pandemic 
was the entity. So connection with the team was very important for me from day one when I joined because I was initially heading the operations team and the operations team consisted of people from different uh, you know, disciplines working in different functions. Somebody was running the facility, the other one lab, the other one uh, front desk reception, another person doing administrative, even though they were in the same group or team, but their work was completely different. Their lingo may not be the same. So, uh, so early on, I, I realized that connectivity between the team is very important. So I started having kind of a daily standing meetings, and it was literally standing. So we're standing uh, around the circle, and people were sharing, you know, what they want to do on a daily basis, and came up with kind of a cadence. And the cadence was, you know, on Mondays we share what is the goal for the week. And every day we touch base that, you know, what are, what's on my mind or what kind of help I need or what are the challenges. And on the end, at the end of the day, on the end of the week was basically sharing the accomplishment that we celebrate all together. So that helped us because that kept us, kept us connected every single day that we reduced it. But being very much in touch with every person in my team try to understand, try to be flexible. There was a you know enormous level of anxiety because you know when I'm overseeing the physical space, it's under my purview. I can't excuse myself that oh sorry, I'm a family, I can't come to this place. I had to come to this. And you would see people who are who were mask deniers, the people who were religious about masks. And you had to keep a balance. You had to really uh, work it out that you know people have to be compliant, but at least they are also your customers, and you have to basically support the team to do to do the same thing. And some people are not comfortable. So you know my presence was very important to prove that I'm with the team. I'm, um, you know, there's no excuse. I would put myself on the same rotation as the team to be together. Uh, we are problem solving with each other. And I realized that it doesn't matter you are the leader or you are a manager. At some point, you are one of the team members. And every input is important because people can bring a lot of value. That, that was really, really proven pretty well. And the other thing that uh, was very important was, you know, in a growing company, you have a lot of ambitions, but you never have time focus or bandwidth to to have a lot of things that you hope you could have done uh, you know accomplished but what we did I realized that oh there is something called policies and guidelines that we have been lacking and that was my idea since I joined Green Town Lab we never had the chance to uh, you know uh, publicize it at that point. Uh, with, with our with our clients, so what we did was, you know, I asked the team to to work together and build that. It was a little bit difficult in the beginning; people had to get into that pattern. But when they warmed up, they enjoyed it. They enjoyed it, and that became a huge accomplishment because at the end of the day, it sold pretty well, and that became kind of a like a guideline for. Uh, managing the space, answering questions to our members, to our, the users of the space, to our the customers. And people saw something rewarding, and it was also showed them the capability that, okay, you know, you don't work in the space, but your work can be still meaningful, and you can share this accomplishment, something that you may not even think that you would do in this job, but you you can do it, uh, and it created kind of bonding between them. Now I would love to talk a little bit about sustainability, climate crisis, uh, those topic you're heavily working in and bringing new tech uh, through entrepreneurship. Can can you first tell us a little bit more how you would approach this topic? 
Definitely, you know, I would say that uh, I would say the way I would see uh, climate tech and climate tech entrepreneurs and uh, what I see now, that may be in the view of many people, right? You know, sustainability is a big topic, right? And maybe my focus goes into the entrepreneurship based on what you're thinking about. Is there a lot of motivated people, a lot of uh, creative people that they, they, they want to make an impact and their work is really addressing climate change and environmental issues that within the purview or under the umbrella of sustainability, right? And, you know, 10 years back, when Green Town Lab was created, I just used Green Town Lab as kind of a reference point for what I, what I tried to, to make. If you go to, to, to that space and you see that people are, you know, somebody is building a balloon to take a generator up in the air because at a certain altitude, there's always wind, capture the wind to generate power on the spot for places that has no, uh, you know, access to power and you're not burning something carbon-based to pollute the environment. Sounded something really cool, right? And amazing. But the question was, how do you make money? Where do you sell it? And there were hopes and wishes. So they were like the surviving artist that you pass by said that this guy is so talented, amazing, but how does he live? How does he make a living, right? So investment and uh, the focus on environment or this, this kind of work was like that, looking at him as surviving art. Uh, but, but now, after the Paris Agreement and also the awareness, the global awareness about uh, seriously, we are in a critical situation with the climate and we see the evidence of the climate change every day. And some people are more I mean, they, they look long term that you have seen waterfalls, you have seen, uh, you know, uh, woods, you have seen places that you enjoyed and you wish that your children, your grandchildren, their children, etc., would enjoy the same thing. And you don't want to see that the quality of nature decline, which has impact on a lot of things from food from vegetation, from uh, ecosystems, and also the life you're going, we, we're going to experience. So you see that, you know, the investment, the government focus has, has come through this way. And now, you know, investors are looking at climate tech companies more seriously, the way they've been looking in biotech or life sciences. So it's a correlation because you pointed out that I work in life sciences that has a good will in it and now an environment. And there, there, there is some similarities that at least solving some fundamental problem related to human being, right? Because we are selfish enough that when, whenever we talk about the environment, the interest of human being is there. It's not just the interest of, you know, sky or soil or water by itself. It has use for human beings, so we, we are trying to, to add this that at that point as well. Uh, but in general, you know, uh, we, we work with a lot of uh, inspiring and creative people, which is a definition of a lot of entrepreneurs that you see in different sectors, that they really believe in what they do. And they really believe in making the world more sustainable and you know, it puts you, if you work with these people over time, even though if you you are not a believer or you, you, you have kind of a rigid mindset, it puts you in kind of a growth mindset to, to really learn, explore, and view things differently and be more mindful. And I'm sure they giving you hope. So that, that's my question to you. Is there hope? You, sa you said... Yeah. At the very beginning, you're trying, what, like you used a word that really stayed here in, in my head about climate, uh, 
kind of slowing the degradation or trying to stop the degradation. So my question to you is, is there hope we will make real strides toward a better, more sustainable world? Yes, yes. And, you know, you the people has asked, okay, you're talking about a bunch of entrepreneurs, a bunch of startup companies that they do cool things, right? Some of them don't scale, or some of them are being acquired. Some of these businesses are being, you know, they get nowhere. That's true. And what is the impact of a nine-employee company in Massachusetts over East Asia, West Asia, you know, South America, Antarctica, etc. Maybe nothing. But when you look at number one, that population of these entrepreneurs, entrepreneurs are growing. The whole focus, and then also because of them, because of the area of innovation, something that brings money, something that brings inspiration, something that is just, you know, all these forces are also shaping some of the larger companies to definitely look into these companies, acquire them, adapt, and change their perspective. That is really enormous, right? You know, sometimes uh, people may say that, you know, the category of uh, corporations, for example, oil and gas, that has been under criticism, right? Uh, you know, you can't just say that, you know, those companies are uh, doing, doing only bad things because if you, you can't put, put all, you know, every type of company in one bucket. You, you see that uh, they're, they're, they're doing some, some, some great things and some of them are really helping to change and, you know, think away just from the fossil fuel invest in a renewable energy. So we say that it's a step at a time. And those steps matter. And the great thing is uh, sometimes I think we are impatient and we we want to achieve the answer right away. But if we look back 10 years ago, 15 years ago, we, we have seen that we have come a long way. Right? Awareness has been made. Now the investment is being made. You know, acquisition, adaptation, all those things are being made. There are a lot are being figured out. And, you know, think about other technologies 20 years ago, 30 years ago. There was skepticism, skepticism around them. There were big questions about them. Some suddenly boomed, collapsed. But overall, it to where we are now. And I see the same thing about sustainability industry in the long run. I don't think there is a point of return. It's a point of no return technically. It's just forward. Which is which is great for for all of us and for the future generations, as yes. you said. I'm gonna give you now a word and I would love a reaction to it. Whatever first comes to mind. The first one is leadership. That's a good one because that's the one that I try to have a definition for myself. Definitely leadership is something to be able to inspire, motivate, and help moving forward. The second one is greenwashing. You're faking something. And it's a bad intention. It has bad outcome. So if I flip this around and double click on it, what is your biggest ask for leaders today from a social impact aspect? Wh whatever industry we're in, what is your biggest ask for us to make uh, real important good strides towards a more sustainable world. Be genuine, be intentional. Because, you know, to, to make this sustainability move forward, uh, you know, to, to get where we, we all desire it gets, uh, it's to, 
it re 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 requires a lot of commitment, a lot of work, uh, not not giving up. So, uh, and, and and really, really, you you need to put a lot of effort in that and be very very you know genuine about what you do, because people it, it, it works out when you're genuine. People see that and, and believe you and follow you, and they you know you you have more buy-in. And the other bond that that I said, you know, in addition to that, to be intentional is, is very important. I think if uh, leadership uh, and in other things, I think it, it, it works pretty well. The third one is sitar. So sitar is the Indian instrument, and sitar, S-E-T-A-R, uh, is the one that I play, and uh, it's like love. It's it's a medium of conversation to to express your heart. Well, what a uh, great segue to my last word: spread love in organizations. It is very important. Uh, spread love into uh, any organization. I think is is something that I that I really really because at the end of the day, uh, uh, during the pandemic. Being in a very, uh, you you have been to Greentown Lab. You have seen the space. People enjoy visiting the space. Uh, people enjoy working here. Uh, it's cool. It's nice. It's it's vibrant. But when the pandemic happened, I felt very depressed every day I came because the energy was not the same. It was felt like Sunday evening that the occupancy was one or two people rather than over 400 or 500 on a daily basis, right? So I realized at that point that, you know, in an incubator, you don't have intellectual property. You have a lot of assets. But now, what's the meaning of these assets when nobody's using it, you know, even for a month or two months? You have to pay a lot, you know, for HVAC, electricity, and all those things. For who and for what? And what, what's important at that point is you would be able to uh, keep something that is meaningful and that is personal and the team. So the team was the biggest asset, in my opinion. Even though the company doesn't have, you know, intellectual property, that is the biggest intellectual property. How can you keep People, you know, people are incentivized, but incentive money becomes a number, and people adapt their lifestyle to that number. And but it's not a long term motivator. Work is the type of work they do is motivator, but the human connection is another. Motivator. And love describes it pretty well. Love, affection. Empathy, they, they work all hand in hand and create kind of a stronger human connection. Any final word of wisdom that should be in for leaders around the world? Have empathy is, is very, very important. You know, business is important, mission is important, responsibility is important, but uh, as long as you work with human beings, as for, for a leader, I think at any manager level, for any person working with any other individual, uh, that's an important factor. Well, thank you so much for this great conversation, this inspiring chat. Thank you for joining me from the lab itself. Uh, and th this is uh, labs are always moving people, as you said. So this is why, from time to time, I know uh, you were moving also around some of the discussions and the lively things happening in the lab. So thank you so much for your time. I know you're doing great things and super busy to uh, make sure that our children and the, our grandchildren will have a better world and a better uh, earth. So thanks for being with me, uh, Jubin, again today. Naji, it was a real pleasure and thank you so much.
Thank you all for listening to Spread Love and Organizations podcast. Subscribe and connect with us on spreadloveio.com or wherever you listen to podcasts. Most importantly, spread love in your organizations and spread the word around you to inspire others and amplify this movement our world so desperately needs.